Welcome. Thank you for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. We hope today's message will help you grow in relationship with Jesus. You can access more gospel resources and ways to connect with our church at iccmemphis.com or by downloading our Island Community Church app. Thanks again for joining us. Well, good morning, church. My name is Barrett Bowden. I'm lead pastor here at Allen Community Church, and I welcome you to worship this morning. If you've got your Bibles, if you get them open to the book of Romans, we are going to be continuing this morning our series called What He's Done, and our study of the book of Romans. This morning, we're going to be in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 And the title of today's message, if you're taking notes, and I always encourage you to, so that you could not just listen to this sermon, but you could live in it and hopefully uh, disciple others in what God has taught you. The title of today's message is The Overflow of Justification. The Overflow of Justification. If you've got your Bibles, I read from the English Standard Version, again, chapter 5 of the book of Romans, starting in verse 1. Therefore... Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die, but but God... He shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, Then much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is God's word. Today we're going to be talking, friends, about the overflow of justification from arguably one of the happiest passages of Scripture um, in the book of Romans, perhaps in the whole Bible. Paul is overflowing here, starting in verse 1. If you look at the start of the passage, the word rejoice, right? And then if you look at verse 11, the same, rejoice. The whole idea of this text is finding great joy in relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, uh, just as a brief reminder, we've been going through um, this book of Romans. I'll give you our main point for the day, and then I'll give you um, a little bit of context for, for where we come into this passage. So our main point for today, all right, the overflow of justification is this. We live our lives constantly grateful for Jesus. For we know that in him we are completely blessed by God. All right? So, of course, I'm talking here about those who are in relationship with Jesus. The main point of our 
focus passage today is, look, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, here's what your life is going to look like. Your life is going to look like constant gratitude for him. In your heart is going to be this overflowing joy in him. The kind of joy that we hear in this passage from start to finish. Because deep, deep in your heart, you know, you know that you know that you know you are right with God. You're right with God because you've trusted in Jesus, the Savior. And you know that in Jesus, you are completely blessed. You are more than blessed. Your cup runs over, as Psalm 23 says. So the life of the one who really has relationship with Jesus is a life of overflowing joy and gratitude for him. Does that make sense? That's kind of the heart of what the passage is all about today. Now, just a reminder, we have a context, right? Um, Paul has been saying again and again in this book, you've got to understand the gospel. You have to understand this announcement of who God is and what he has done in Jesus Christ to save all who trust in him. And we've been going over these key verses in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Are y'all ready for this? So if you've got them memorized, or if you can read the screen, for those of you who are cheaters in the room, um, then let's say it together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so far in the book of Romans, Paul has helped us to see that all of us are in need of the gospel. For all of us are great sinners. All of us have turned from God in our hearts. All of us have turned from the creator to creation and even to ourselves. And we have made ourselves everything rather than God being everything. And therefore, deserved condemnation has fallen on all of us. We, he says in chapters 1 to 3, desperately need a salvation that we cannot provide ourselves. We need something to change in our relationship with God. And this something that needs to change, we can't do ourselves. Which is why the good news of the gospel that he brings in, starting in verse 21 of chapter 3, is such good news because he says God has done what you and I could never do. God came himself to bring salvation. God came himself to be your redeemer. He came himself to to take on your sin, to offer you forgiveness. He came to give you his righteousness. He came to offer complete atonement and mercy. He came to rescue you, to save you. He can put you right. Won't you trust him? He announces Jesus as a great Savior. Yes, you are a great sinner. You're more sinful and flawed than you ever dared to believe. But at the same time, Jesus is a great Savior. And you are more loved and can be more accepted than you ever dared to hope. This is the beauty of the gospel that that Paul presents. And he says, don't you see this gift of undeserved grace? And then we got to last week, chapter 4. And where we left off last week, if y'all remember, the big idea was that the way that God has always made people right with him has been through faith. And we looked at the case study of Abraham, if you remember, and we talked about how God does not make people right through works and how God does not make people right through religious adherence or observances or ceremonies. God does not make people right through adherence even to the law. There is only one way to be right with God, and that is to transfer your complete trust to him, to depend not at all on anything that you can do, but all on him and what he can do. And to yield your hearts to him in faith, living dependently on him. And the Bible says, for all who look to Jesus and transfer their trust to him, that you will be saved. This is how God has always made people right with him. And this is how we can be right with him. And we looked at the very end of chapter 4 of those marks 
of faith. How true faith is hope-filled and unwavering and God-glorifying and confident. And we ended last week by talking about how this faith, this faith in um, Jesus Christ, ultimately, one of the, the, the big characteristics of this faith is that it is here blessed. My pencil's not going to work today, guys. So we are going to just, once again, hope for the best, okay? Um, we're blessed. Now, the reason I want to remind you of that is because straight out of the very last verse of chapter 4, okay, comes chapter 5, verse 1. And what I want you to see today is that Paul is continuing his thought, right? Right out of chapter 4, because at the start of chapter 5, verse 1, we see this big word right here. Aha! Therefore. Now, one of the things you've got to learn to do in the Bible is every time you see the word therefore, you've got to ask yourself, what is it? Okay, great. So what he's saying is, if you come to a point where you have transferred your complete trust to Jesus, if you come to a point where you've looked to him and you know how desperately you need salvation, and you know what a great salvation he offers, and how it's all by grace and it's not by you, and, and if you just give your whole self to him and you trust him, God will make you righteous. God will put things right deep in your heart. God can work with power in your heart to set you back right with him. But once you come to that point, Paul says something, some, some amazing things happen. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. In other words, for those who have been made right with God through their trust in Jesus Christ then what's going to start happening is all of these unbelievable overflows, like a big fountain just gushing, all right? Essentially what's happening is in this chapter, he's going, if you are right with Jesus Christ, I I just want to to rejoice in the blessings that, that just come out, that overflow into every nook and cranny of your life. I want to tell you, All the ways that this changes, not just your position with God, but changes your relationship with God and changes your life every single day. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at six of these blessings of justification, all right? And we're going to make a list as we go through. So if you're writing and you're taking notes, you should be getting to a total of six as we go through today, but there are six blessings that flow out of right relationship with God. And the first one is this, total peace with God. Total peace with God. Verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Has anybody ever been to Shelby Farms? Show of hands. Okay. I like the buffalo. I always try to find them. I think it's the weirdest thing ever that we have buffalo at Shelby Farms, but it's pretty cool. Um, I went to Shelby Farms, I guess it was last summer, we were doing a little bike ride, and uh, one of the ponds there has a little gazebo, and we were like walking up to the little gazebo, and there's a little plaque there with a quote on it from Henry David Thoreau. I happen to wax poetic at times, and so I happen to pay attention to this quote, and the quote there on the, on the plaque, I wish I had taken a picture of it because it would be a lot cooler to show you this morning than just to tell you, but it said, many men go fishing all of their lives without knowing that it is not fish that they are after. That was interesting, right? Many men go fishing all of their lives without knowing it's not fish that they're after. As I was thinking about um, that quote, and I was thinking about this particular passage this morning, one of the things that 
came to mind that I know is absolutely true, and you do too. People search their whole lives for real peace. Um, when we talk about peace, what we're talking about is the sense of shalom, right? In the Hebrew word, it's, it's the word shalom. It's the sense that all is well. Like everything is completely good. Like there's, not, there's no tension. There's nothing like left to do. There's nothing like, ugh, I just wish I could. No, it's just like everything, like every single thing. Like the, your, your total self, like you are good. And what I know, what you know, is that people search for peace their whole lives, looking for it in relationships, looking for it in perfectionism. I don't know anything about that, but I've heard that some people like to have everything just right. Often that will go with looking for it in control. As long as I can keep things in order, things will be good. Looking for it in achievement. in the right resume, in the right amount of money saved up or flowing for entertainment or purchases or experiences, whatever it is that your heart is desiring. People look for peace in acceptance. People look for peace on vacations. If I could just get off work enough, then all would be well, right? The absence of responsibility. Or adventures. Having enough highs. Doing enough experiences. Having those rock, rock and awesome moments, right? But the reality is, friends, there is only one way for real and lasting peace. And the thing is that you cannot gain real peace from experiences that creation offer to you. The only way that you can gain real peace is to have real peace with the Creator Himself. See, there's only one way for real and lasting peace, and that way is having a right relationship with God. Coming to a point where you know that you know that you know that all is well between you and the one who made you, between you and the one who deserves you, between you and God. Peace doesn't come through other people. Peace doesn't come through having everything under control. Peace can never come through your accomplishments, your achievements. Peace can't come through other people recognizing you. Peace cannot even come through vacations, friends. You can spend a lot of money and go a lot of cool places and be amazing, have amazing experiences in other parts of the world and still not have real peace or at least peace that lasts. Peace doesn't come through money or adventure. Peace comes when you're right with God. Peace comes through Jesus Christ. And what's so amazing about verse 1 is he says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have, what? Peace. But notice what he says. It's not just like peace within yourself or peace in the sense of like, you know, my body just feels relaxed or my mind's at ease. He's pointing to a peace that's more objective than this. He's saying you have peace. What kind of peace? With God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have total peace. And this peace is a peace with God. 
And it's a peace that is relational. Um, most of us understand relational brokenness. I don't know about you, but I've had a conflict before. Has anybody in the room ever had a conflict with another person? If you're married in the room, you ever had a conflict with your spouse, don't raise your hand, because I'm sure the problem was your fault, okay? All of us are familiar. You, any, pretty much anywhere you find a relationship, you're going to find some opportunity for conflict. Can I get a witness? Yeah. And most of us understand what relational brokenness looks like, whether it's a conflict with your friend or a coworker or a roommate or a spouse. We can't pretend like everything is okay when deep down we know that it's not okay. You ever walked into a relationship and all of a sudden you feel the cold shoulder? You feel the distance? And, you, and, you, and the only way to get through that is to figure out what went wrong and then to work to put it back right. Some kind of reconciliation is needed. You can't just have a patched up kind of peace. To have true relational intimacy, there's got to be a true and deep reconciliation. Wrongs that are put back right. The same is true in our relationship with God. See, one of the ways that the Bible helps us to understand our own sin is that it's a wrong against God. And that creates this fracture of our relationship, of our intimacy. And we can't just pretend like everything's okay when things are not reconciled between us and God. We can't just patch that up with religious attendance or good work or hoping and talking that everything's okay. No, like reconciliation actually needs to happen. An acknowledgement of the wrong done and an opportunity to put that back right. Well, what's so amazing about Jesus is that when Jesus came for us, one of the reasons he came was to put our relationship with God back right. And when we look to Jesus in faith, when we look to him, who he is and what he did in his life and what he accomplished in his death on the cross in our place, when we look to him and his new life from the grave and his life today and his promises, when we look to him and we put all of our trust in him, one of the overflowing benefits and blessings of his work for us is that we now can know that we know that we know that we know that things have really been reconciled between us and God. The brokenness of our relationship is really, it's really okay. The Bible speaks of this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, for he says, For in him all of the fullness of God, talking about Jesus, was pleased to dwell, and through him to do what? To reconcile to himself all things, whether in earth or in heaven, making what? Peace by the blood of his cross. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, both of these other letters from the Apostle Paul, who also wrote the book of Romans, he says, don't you see all this is from God, who through Christ did what? Reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was what? I'm going to need a little bit more participation this morning. God was what? reconciling the world to himself. Some of y'all are new this morning. You're like, is this normal? Do you always talk back to the preacher in church? I would like it to be normal, okay? I don't know that it is normal, but we're on our way, all right? I like the feedback. So, um, yeah, Jesus came to bring 
reconciliation. And it's quite amazing. Because in your search for peace, I'm telling you, there is literally no other way that you can have deep shalom, complete rest of soul, unless you know that all is right between you and God. And the amazing gift of Jesus Christ is when you trust him and receive him, you can know that you know that you know that all is right between you and God. Have you all ever met Tom Crocker, our associate pastor of member care? Some of y'all are like, woohoo! Um, Tom is back here. You can see the light shining off his head. He's the bald one over here. Uh, I love you, Tom. And you got to know that I love you because I'm poking fun at you. But what I'm about to say is not poking fun. It's one of the most sincere uh, compliments that I could give someone. You are one of the most godly men I know. <laughs> I didn't expect to get emotional. I love Tom. One of the things that Tom has taught me, among many, is something he's never sat down and said, I'd like to teach you a lesson on this. But instead, he's modeled something. And he's probably modeled it to you if you've ever talked to Tom. If you ever walk up to Tom and you say, hey, Tom, he'll sit there without much expression, very steady. Well, hello, Barrett. <laughs> How are you? He'll often put his hands out like this, and I go in for my hug. How are you, Tom? What does he say? Have you ever talked to him? Yeah. It is well. He'll say it with this voice that's like, you really believe it? You know, it's like, <laughs> and he like hesitates before he says it, like he's going to, he's got to really think about how he's going to answer. I'm like, you answer the same way every time. <laughs> Why do you have to think about this? It is well. It is well. Really, how are you? <laughs> it is well. It is well. Some of y'all may not know Tom in the ways that I've gotten to know him. Some of you know him more. Some may not know him as well. But I know Tom, and I've known him long enough to know that sometimes I know kind of the circumstances he's going through in his life. And sometimes I'm like, why in the world are you saying it is well? Because I know that things are hard in different aspects of his life. He's a real person, <laughs> like all of us. And life is not always so to speak, feels so great. And yet Tom maintains an answer. How are you? And his answer is coming not with an eye on circumstance, but with an eye on the Father, God. His answer is coming from a deep place in his soul, a deep place of shalom, a place of true rest. Because he has trusted God completely. He's trusted Jesus Christ. And he knows truly that all is well between him and God. And therefore, if all is well between him and God, he can answer with true faithfulness. Everything else is well. He's saying, I'm at rest with God. <laughs> That's how I hear his answer. How are you, Tom? I'm at rest with God. It is well. What a gift to know you, Tom Crocker. <laughs> and what a gift to have your example in our midst. Because I really believe what Paul is saying is for every single one of us who have transferred our complete trust to Jesus Christ, one of the overflows of that relationship with Jesus is that all of us can answer when anyone is asked, how are you? We can answer from the depth of our soul, it is well, because we know that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if that is a reality, then truly, friends, at the deepest level of all reality, it is well. Amen? And it's not just peace with God, it's also the peace of God. This is not directly spoken to in this passage, but I wanted to hit it just briefly before I move to the second blessing because one of the things that I know that you desire 
is in your experience with God day to day for you to have the peace of God. Now, what I want to tell you is there is a difference. You cannot have the peace of God if you do not have peace with God. Okay? And you can always have peace with God if you're in Jesus Christ when even in your experience in the moment, you don't feel the peace of God. There is a distinction. But one of the great blessings for those who do trust Jesus is not only to have the opportunity to have peace with God, which is what is principally being talked about here in verse 1 of chapter 5, but also to have the experience of peace of God. In times where you are anxious, you have the opportunity to look to Jesus and to reestablish surrender in your life that leads to his peace. Jesus says in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. It's not like the world gives do I give to you. He said, I'm not taking you to the Ritz-Carlton in Bora Bora. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about filling your bank account so you feel secure. We're not talking about a guarantee of perfect health so you never have to stress. We're not talking about everything going right. No, no, no. He's talking about an inner peace, an experience of trust that is possible when you know him. When you know him, then you'll know his peace. When you trust him, then you'll have his peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It's not like the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Trust in Jesus. John 16, 33, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Trust him. Trust in what he said. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God gives total peace. If you're in Jesus Christ, the first overflow of justification is what? That you have what? Total peace. All right. Second, as we look at the second overflow of justification, we make our way through the passage, we see that not only do we have total peace, but we have accessible grace. We have accessible grace. I want to look at verse 2. As Paul continues to over, the overflow, since we have been justified by faith, second blessing here, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Um, I want to pay attention right here to this word, access. This is in the original language. I'm going to write the word. Presagoge. Oops, excuse me. Presagoge. I know that may not mean anything to you, but it does mean something for our understanding of this passage. Because this word in the original language means this. It means to bring near. It means like to make an introduction. The word carries with it, um, it, it's so much more, I guess what I I want to help you understand, because in chapter 3, there was a lot of like being right with God in terms of like a positional standing with God in a judicial sense, which we desperately need. We need a righteousness credited to us. We need before the throne room of God to, to, to know that we know that we are right with God, that we've been forgiven, made clean, that we're put right with him now and forever. But here, this is not talking in the judicial sense. This is much more in the familial sense. So when we're talking about access in here in verse 2 of chapter 5, what we're talking about is how Jesus Christ has opened this invitation for a new kind of relationship with God. And and this relationship with him is an ongoing relationship and a familial relationship. 
with God. It's a picture of like, um, imagine the President of the United States has the executive power to issue, a lot of times it happens at the end of their terms, but they'll issue pardons. Y'all ever heard of this? They have the ability to authorize a pardon of crime. And if you receive that pardon, you would be incredibly grateful to have received that pardon if you are truly a criminal. The unbelievable act of forgiveness from the highest of authorities. But it would be a whole nother thing for you to get a phone call from the president and say, hey, uh, can we go get coffee this afternoon down at Vice and Virtue? I really like to hang out. And then for that coffee to lead into another coffee and to lead into a true friendship and even the opportunity to grow to the sense that you like become like a family member to the first family. Some of y'all may not want that depending on your politics, okay? But what I'm trying to say is if you think about the office apart from politics, how crazy would that be? That not only there was this pardon but also there's this opportunity for relationship with the one who has total power. In the same way, Paul is trying to say to us, do you realize that in Jesus Christ, through Jesus, we have also obtained access? Yes, he has issued a pardon over your life, but he's also invited you near. He wants to know you. He wants to give his love to you, his heart to you. He wants to sit with you and be growing an intimate relationship with you. How amazing that our God offers us access. I picture um, the prodigal son story in Luke chapter 15. After living far away in rebellion against um, the father, after squandering what he gave us, in a place of deserving great shame. Jesus tells a story because we're that son. (laughs) And he's the father. And he says the son comes home and not only is he forgiven, but he's embraced. The shocking nature of this story. The one who deserves shame is now he's, the father's taken his ring off of his own finger, put it on his finger, taken the, clo- the beautiful clothes off his back and put it on him. He's welcomed him home and he's thrown us a party. A party of grace. And Jesus tells you this story because he wants you to know something of the father's heart. The father loves you and gives grace to you that is a, it's an unbelievable grace. It's a grace that offers you access, access to him again. We see passages in scripture like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What he's saying, if you're in Jesus Christ, you need to know that like, you're in a whole new standing in your relationship with God. And now, now that you're in Jesus Christ, here, here's what flows from the heart of God for you. It's what John 1 talks about. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. The Father's heart and the Father's way toward you now in Jesus Christ is one of grace. You have access to him. And you have access to the incredible grace that he gives. You can hear his heart, come to me. Anytime, anywhere, come to me. Let me give to you sufficient grace. This is what Paul learned. He speaks of it late in one of his letters to the church of Corinth. I have learned that his grace is sufficient for me. Some people use the acronym for grace. It's really cheesy, but if it works for you, you can take it. 
G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. The beautiful reality of the riches of God, from his fullness, the riches of God, that come and come and come because of Jesus and all he's done for you. Do you know that he's gracious to you? That anytime, anywhere, you now stand with access to him and you stand as a recipient of his grace. The third blessing that we have as an overflow of justification is the blessing of unshakable hope. Unshakable hope. Here in verse 2, we read, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now this word in Greek is el peace. Okay, And essentially what this word means, it's, it's so much better in the original language than it is in English. And I, there's like no way to fully convey it. It's essentially, though, what we're talking about here is a conviction. Okay, Like we rejoice in this deep conviction of the glory of God. It differs for us because I think a lot of times when we use the word in English, hope, What we're talking about in English, a lot of times in our thought, we think wishful thinking. Oh, I hope that happens. I really hope that tomorrow um, it stops raining. But we don't really know. I really hope that, um, you, you 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 name it. Wishful thinking. But in the scripture, when we read hope, what we're talking about is confident expectation. And even we could say it's like an eager anticipation. Because in the verse, um, what you see here is it's a hope of the glory of God. So if you think about the first three overflows of justification, one is kind of past, one is present, and the third is future. So the first one is kind of past. We have peace with God. That's a past act on the basis of the cross. It's a done deal. Things are reconciled between us and God. We have this present grace in which we stand. That's present. That's a blessing that right now I have access to the Father and access to his grace. And then when we're talking here in this third one, and we also have hope, that's future. So what Paul's saying is God has blessed you past. He has blessed you present. And here he's saying he's blessed you future. You have this deep certainty that in the future... All is going to be wonderful. The fullness of all that he's promised will be realized. The fullness of all that you have trusted will will be realized. The, The fullness of his perfect presence forever. That's what he's saying here. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What are we talking about? We are convicted. We are sure. We have confident expectation that we will be with God forever. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The things that he's promised, they will all come to pass. He is who he says he is. He will do what he says he will do. I am good with him now, and I will be good with him forever. And I have an eager anticipation of this life with God only getting better and better and better. I have hope. That's what we're talking about here. An unshakable hope. Now, the question would rightfully come. Well, it's easy to talk about hope, Paul, or Pastor Barrett. But things are going great, you know? <laughs> like, I just have this hope. I'm just so excited about things to come. But, but let's get real. Like, life sucks sometimes. I mean, like this week in our city, like, you mean to tell me you're going to walk into the funeral right across the street here, Mississippi Boulevard? And this is a message you could preach over there? Did you see what happened? Can you imagine the suffering they're going through? The injustice, 
the brutality, the deep sense of wrong. That's not just a single instance, but it's compounded by a history that is, I mean, can you imagine? And you're, you're trying to tell me, oh yeah, you, you can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Does that feel a little trite to you? Like, I mean, I get that on good days, but there's some days where like, we just, we're just sitting in silence and tears. And that's all we have is tears. Some of you in this room have suffered greatly. Perhaps even now, you're in the middle of a circumstance or situation that is unspeakably difficult. Where words fail. You've experienced this in the past. Perhaps you're experiencing it right now or you may in the future. This world is broken, friends. Suffering is real. And the question is, what about that, Paul? (laughs) What about that? Like, what about those days? What about those moments where the phone rings, circumstances cave in, where everything feels like it's just completely out of control? The depth of your pain is overwhelming. What about that, Paul? Paul says to us directly, verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What a weird reality this seems to speak to. We rejoice in our sufferings. One thing I want you to know here is when it says here rejoice in our sufferings, well, my pen's disconnected again. We're not going to worry about it. When it says here, in our sufferings, what we're saying here is he's not saying that we're saying suffering is good. That's not what he's saying. And the original language is very clear. He's not saying, oh, I'm just so happy that things are so terrible. Like, I love, I love this hard stuff. Or making us like proud of sufferings as if somehow suffering makes us better than people who don't suffer. Like we wear it as a badge of honor. We suffered or we are suffering. That's not what he's saying. It, it's not that at all. The original language is clear. He's saying we rejoice in the midst of our sufferings. In the middle of the time Where things are so broken. Even then, even then, we can rejoice. Now, one of the things that I appreciate about this verse, and I just want to make this very plain, um, one of the things this verse tells you is that God understands our brokenness, He understands the brokenness of this world. God knows that things are broken. He knows that things are hard. Even Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. He's not apathetic to our sufferings. He's not distant. He's not unaware. He is El Roi, the God who sees. He knows us. I'm so grateful that the Bible speaks honestly about what we experience in real life. Aren't you grateful? There's nothing in the Bible that says when you come to Jesus, all of your problems in this world will just suddenly go away. Or that you'll never suffer. Or you'll never hurt. People will never betray you. Or hurt you. Or insult you. Or abuse you. There's nothing in the Bible that says if you trust in Jesus, you'll never get a terminal diagnosis. 
Things will always go well for you. That is not the gospel. It's not the truth of Scripture. When you hear people talking like that, they're not preaching the Bible. The Bible is honest about the fact that things in this world are broken. Life is hard. We follow a Savior, you guys, who walked the Via Della Rosa, the way of tears. Our faith is in one who is a suffering servant. And he says, if I suffer, so also will you. Even when you walk, Psalm 23, through the valley of the shadow of death, he's, he's saying there's going to be some valleys. But the, the, the thing is, it's not that we don't have the valleys. It's that he wants us to know that in the midst of the valley, what does he say? I'm with you. In this world, you have many troubles, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. Paul's train of thought here in verse 3 is, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces, what's the first word there? Endurance. Now what is this about? When we're talking here about endurance, it's really, the, the best way to understand this in the original language is like a single-mindedness. So what he's saying is, like, suffering makes us focus. Like, when you're in the middle of a hard time, it really makes you focus on what is really important. Suddenly, things that were important to yesterday are not as important to me today. It helps me remember the things that are really lasting. It, it like, a, like a blind or a horse, right? It removes distractions from me. Suffering inevitably leads us to that kind of single-mindedness. So what Paul's asking you to do is say, do you, is anybody in their experience of suffering, or even right now, have you, have you seen this to be true? That it creates single-mindedness? Paul's saying this is true. And this single-mindedness produces, the word he uses here is character. And really, what... The best way to understand this is to understand it as like testedness. Okay? Um, a kind of confidence that comes because you've been through an experience. Uh, Georgia Bulldogs won the national championship this year. Did y'all know that? This seems like a very odd time to bring in Georgia football. But I felt pretty confident that Georgia was going to whoop up on TCU. Because TCU is a Cinderella team and had never been under the big light, so to speak, in that kind of national spotlight before in that kind of game. Georgia had been there numerous times on the way to being able to win their first championship last year. And then after winning last year, going back in this year, that team was a tested team. And they looked more mature on the field, didn't they? They looked like they knew how to win a championship. And in fact, they did because it was like a 58-point win. All right? We really whooped up on them. Sorry, I'm gloating in Georgia football. But the idea is because of their experience, they were tested. And suffering does that to us. It puts us in an experience where our faith, which which could just rest like in our head or in our conversation, but our faith has to actually truly rest completely on Jesus. And this character produces, this experience and testedness produces hope. Because as you, in the middle of suffering, put your whole assurance and confidence in Jesus, you find him faithful. What happens is our hope is purified because, for instance, if you are tempted to look other places other than Jesus, suddenly in the midst of suffering, you're going to only look to Jesus. Other things that you have depended on, suddenly 
feel very small in comparison to the thing you're going through. And it leads you to put more and more of your trust in Jesus. And as you do that, more and more, you will feel everything is going to be okay because he is faithful. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Friends, I want to ask you right now, do you believe and will you receive that Jesus can bring you an unshakable hope? You're going to experience difficulties in life. You are. But the difficulties do not mean that God doesn't love you, that he's not for you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear because he's with me. The measure of the blessing of God is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of his being with you in the midst of whatever trouble you're going through. Do you see? There's a big difference. Let God work in you. Don't resist God when you're going through suffering. You don't have to like the suffering. It's not what he's saying. But he's saying there's an opportunity in the midst of suffering to learn more of God. There's an opportunity to to become more single-minded for him. There's an opportunity to to experience more of him. And there's an opportunity for your rock-solid confidence in him to grow as you abandon hope in anything else and put all of your hope in Jesus. In the midst of trouble, let God grow your hope. God is much more concerned for your character than your comforts. Let God grow your hope. Though our outward body be wasting away, on the inside we're being renewed day by day. Let God grow your hope. It's one of the great blessings of the justification. Well, we move now to the fourth overflow of justification. And there's an understandable question that comes up as we get to this point. And the question is this, uh, well, how can we be so sure that this hope won't disappoint us? Because like, if I'm going through this, like, I got to know that I know that I know that this, you're encouraging me to put my hope in Jesus in the midst of this, that this hope is real. And the fourth and fifth blessings of justification answer this question, all right? And that is that you can know that you know that you know this hope is real because of the lavish love that he has for you, verses 5 through 8. It starts by pointing to an internal experience of this love. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is an internal and experiential evidence of God's love. When you turn to God and you're saved, he fills you with his Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in the lives of all of us who believe in Jesus is the Holy Spirit reminds us, I love you. I love you. He loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. There is an assurance of his love. There's an assurance that you're his child. There's an assurance of your acceptance, an assurance that there's no condemnation over your life. You have been set free. You are his, and he loves you. Read the testimonies of most saints, um, whether you read a biography, history book, and you will, a diary, you'll read people who have an overwhelming assurance of the love of God for them. One of the things that happens when you're going through suffering, 
I've experienced it. Many in this room are experiencing it right now, or you have, and you could testify to it. But in the midst of it all, you may not be able to understand everything that's going on, the circumstances of your life, but one thing that you are sure of is he loves me. The Holy Spirit testifies within us that we are his. But it's not the only or even the primary basis of our assurance, our feeling, although it is a feeling that the Holy Spirit guarantees. But even in the midst of a time where you don't feel that or you feel like you can't hear that voice, Paul encourages you to look externally and historically to another sure sign of his lavish love when he says in verse 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What Paul is urging you to do is what I am also at this moment urging you to do. Look to the cross of Jesus. If you want to know how do I know that God loves me, look to the cross of Jesus. Look at how he loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son. If God did not love you, would he have given himself for you? No. The fact that he gave himself for you is sure sign that he loves you. Jesus said, there's no greater love than one would have than this, than one would lay down his life for his friends. And you, he says, are my friends. Look at the cross. He laid down his life for you. God's love was demonstrated for us. He has shown us his love. It's not just, I've got to figure it out. Do I just feel like it? Am I sure? It's not just these ideas floating around. He's going, no, there's proof of his love. There's historical objective evidence for his love. And it's in the face of Jesus Christ. Look at him. And look at how he lived. And look at how he died for you on the cross. And look at how he was buried. And look at how he was raised from the dead. Look at Jesus And as you look at Jesus, you can know that you know that you know that he loves you. And what's so amazing is that he says, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He makes this argument and says, like, look, like, how many of you would, like, lay down your life for, like, a criminal? How many of you today would lay down your life for a convicted felon, 201 Poplar? I mean, you might, you might lay down your life for your spouse. You might lay down your life for your kid. But if I ask you to lay down your life for a convicted felon most of you are going to hesitate or even refuse. So therefore, never ever question how lavish the love of God is for you because, friend, for you to understand yourself, you got to understand you're the convicted felon. In the spiritual court, you committed rebellion against him. You turned from him. You deserve wrath by your own recognition. You're deserving of condemnation. And yet, he loved you so much that even that being your state, he, the perfect eternal God, took your place on the cross. He laid down his life for you. Greater love has no one than this, than he, he would lay down his life for you. Think about the moment that you were most ashamed of yourself. What's the greatest sin you ever committed? The moment where you just go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. The pig pen moment of Luke 15. Where? Think about that moment. Paul's asking you to. Think about the shame, the pit that you're in. The worst of the worst. 
And what Paul's asking you to consider is, is at that moment, it's at that moment, right there at that moment, that God himself gave himself for you. Do you know the love of God for you? In the depth of your shame and condemnation and need came the riches of his love. He loves you. If he loved you at your worst moment, friend, you can know that he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. If he did not spare his own son, you can know he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So friends, if you want to know, how can I be sure that this hope, that this hope can be real? Paul says, you can be sure because this hope will lead you to the face of Jesus Christ. And in his face, you can know that he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Well, Paul closes out his section by giving us two other overflows, and I'll give them to you quickly as I close. Number five is a sure salvation, and number six is a real joy. We will come back to discussion of a sure salvation more as we get into chapter six, but for the moment, I'll read verses nine, 10, and 11 as we close. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What Paul is saying is, friends, <laughs> you can have assurance, total assurance that the work of Jesus in the past can bring you security in the present and can bring you assurance of what is to come. And all of this leads us to this kind of like wondrous amazement of like, how can this be? Amazing love, how can this be that you, my king, would die for me? That's verse 11. More than that, like, we just... We just rejoice. We rejoice in God through Jesus, through whom we've now received reconciliation. I'm going to live my life constantly grateful for Jesus, for I know in him that I'm completely blessed by God. If while I was an enemy, he died for me, how much more now that I've been reconciled can I be sure that he's for me? Friends, I wonder today if you know the blessings of justification. It starts with being justified. And if you're here today and you don't have right relationship with God, I want to urge you to come to Jesus. Because none of these things that we're talking about as overflows can be possible until you are right with him. Today could be a day of salvation. But for the rest of us who do know Jesus, I wonder today, do you know? Do you know you have, you have peace, total peace? Do you know that? All is well. <laughs> and if you're going through something that's just giving you great anxiety today, I just want you to look to Jesus. And I just want you to receive from him his shalom. All is well. Do you know today that you have access to his grace? Do you know today that he loves you and he's for you and he's opened up his heart to you and his grace abounds to you in the present right now? Grace is yours. If you're in a place of brokenness or need, sin this morning, receive from his grace upon grace. Do you know today that you have unshakable hope. The song we're about to sing is a song that we've chosen to be voice in the midst of our suffering. It's a song that 
We can sing for ourselves. We can sing for others. We could even sing for our community at this time. But in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of suffering and pain, in the valley of the shadow of death, we can still have hope. We have hope because of Jesus. Our confidence is not in perfect circumstance. Our confidence is in a perfect Savior who, despite our circumstance, will see us through. And on the day that's coming again, that we'll hear his voice, I've made all things new. We have hope in Jesus. Do you know being justified, being made right with God, that he loves you more than you ever know? Let the Holy Spirit give you a sense of his love. Even now you can say, Holy Spirit, love me. Assure me of your love. And then look to the cross of Jesus. And remember that when you were at your worst, he gave his best. Do you know that you know that you know that he loves you? You can know that. And that know that you're saved and then live your life just going, I'm so grateful for Jesus. So as our prayer counselors come this morning, you can stand, you can sit, you can come and pray. But we just respond with this song. Thank you again for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church. We want to encourage you to join us in person for worship soon. For more information about our worship gatherings, gospel resources, and ways to connect with ICC, you can visit us at iccmemphis.com or download our Island Community Church app. As we close, we offer a prayer of blessing for you from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.